Welcome uh, to Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce uh, Dr. Nicholas to you. Um, uh, I want to remind you all to uh, put your uh, questions in the Q&A box so that uh, we can moderate the uh, question answer period at the end of the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Dr. Jacinda Nicholas is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine. Um, she received her bachelor's uh, degree in human biology from Stanford University and a master's in anthropology. Uh, she then uh, matriculated at Harvard Medical School and received her MD from Harvard, as well as her uh, master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, she was a house officer at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and then did her fellowship in general internal medicine and integrative medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas um, has focused her research uh, activities on women's health, specifically uh, focusing on uh, women uh, at altitude, uh, gestational diabetes, postpartum weight loss, and also postpartum fitness. Uh, she's received funding from the NIH through a K award mechanism uh, to support this work, and is gonna be talking with us about mobile health uh, to decrease diabetes and heart disease in women. Dr. Nicholas. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Welcome everyone. Uh, sorry that we can't do this in person, but maybe sometime soon. So today I'll speak about mobile health to decrease risk for diabetes and heart disease in women. I have no disclosures. So my learning objectives for today, we'll start with discussing the importance of pregnancy complications to reveal increased risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We'll then discuss the current guidelines for decreasing cardiometabolic risk. And I'll present results of some of my studies, including the Balance After Baby and Fit After Baby eHealth randomized trials. Let's start with a case though. This is a typical patient of mine. She's a 35 year old woman. Her BMI is 35. She's 12 weeks postpartum from the birth of her first child. Her pregnancy was complicated by gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. And she has a strong family history of type two diabetes. So what should we tell her about her future risk? Well, first let's take a step back. And I think most people on this, in this presentation know this, but the prevalence of diabetes in the US is continuing to rise and it's really been skyrocketing along with the incidence of obesity in the US. And this is true even more so in certain ethnic groups. And I focus on women. So if you look at the blue bars here, you can see that white women actually have some, white non-Hispanic women have some of the lowest risk of diabetes compared to Hispanic, black non-Hispanic, Asian non-Hispanic and American Indian Alaska native women. So we're really seeing an increase in diabetes among these um, other race and ethnicities as well. The other thing that's important to note is that although heart disease deaths in general are going down, we're seeing this strange increase in middle-aged women. And I think part of what I focus my research on is trying to identify these women uh, so that we can figure out how to intervene and bring down the death rates for them as well. So what are we missing? Well, we know that 64% of women and 50% versus 50% of men had no previous symptoms before a fatal cardiovascular event. And about 20% of all coronary events actually occur in individuals without traditional risk factors. So what I focus my research on is looking at pregnancy as a stress test to reveal cardi risk for cardiometabolic disease. So if we look at this figure, this is a normal woman. So this woman in orange has two pregnancies and then sometime in middle age, she crosses over this threshold, the clinical threshold for vascular metabolic disease. But the woman I'm interested in may have some increased risk from um, her in utero exposures. And then she has two pregnancies that actually pop over this line. She develops her metabol cardiometabolic disease earlier and more severely than her counterpart. And why does this happen? Well, it's multifactorial, as you might imagine. There are a lot of pre-pregnancy risk factors that come in, smoking, body mass index, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, family history, and some inner uterine risk factors. But then the stress test of pregnancy can reveal pregnancy complications like hypertensive disorders, gestational diabetes, fetal growth restriction or preterm delivery. 
Later in life, we will see their risk factors, chronic hypertension, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, overweight, obesity, and inflammation, and eventually leading to cardiovascular events like MI and stroke. So the reason we can use pregnancy as this stress test is that um, these pregnancy complications reveal increased risk. So here you can see a figure showing women with a history of GDM, gestational diabetes, have a high risk of type 2 diabetes um, during their lifetime. And even in the five to 10 years uh, after their index pregnancy, they have a risk of 30 to 70% increased risk for type 2 diabetes. So it is very high. Having a history of gestational diabetes also just increases your overall risk for cardiometabolic disease. So as we just saw, if you look in the upper left, women with diabetes have a much, much higher risk of, um, women with gestational diabetes have a much higher risk of type two diabetes. But we see that gestational diabetes also increases risk for hypertension and for ischemic heart disease as well. So the overall relative risk, if we look at a meta-analysis for gestational diabetes and risk for cardiovascular disease is actually 1.7. And that's true. You may be thinking, well, of course, if you have gestational diabetes, then you get type two diabetes, then your cardiovascular risk is of course quite high. So that is true, and that's the highest risk group. If you look at this figure, the dotted line is the, those women who had gestational diabetes and then type two diabetes. But even without developing type two diabetes, there's still increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So this is an important indicator nonetheless. The hazard ratio is 2.8 for having gestational diabetes, then type two diabetes, but it's still 1.3 for women, even if they don't have type two diabetes. Another important pregnancy complication is preeclampsia. So if we look at, here's a meta-analysis of preeclampsia and future risk of ischemic heart disease, and we can see that the total relative risk is 2.1. Similarly, there's an increased risk from preeclampsia and risk of stroke, a total stroke relative risk of 1.8 in this meta-analysis. And we also see gestational hypertension. So women who don't have preeclampsia, but they still have new hypertension during pregnancy still has an increased risk. Where if you look in this figure, the black line over at the top is women who did not have gestational hypertension. Then the red line is women who had gestational hypertension. So their risk for cardiovascular disease is increased. And then women who have more than one condition. So these women in green who have gestational hypertension and small for gestational age or small for gestational age and preterm um, also have increased, even more increased risk. And the overall hazard ratio just for gestational hypertension is 1.8. So I think we should consider these along with traditional risk factors. So when we look at traditional risk factors, uh, we have smoking 3.1, hypertension 2.5, type 2 diabetes 2.4, high cholesterol 2.2, family history 1.9, and then BMI 1.2 per five units. And when we put these next to the traditional risk factors, we can see also indication of risk. So GDM has a hazard ratio 1.7, preeclampsia 2.2, gestational hypertension 1.8, preterm delivery 1.4, and small for gestational age 1.8. So what do the guidelines say? So I remember when I trained, I don't think we learned much about the importance of pregn pregnancy complications at all when thinking about primary care. But I think now it is there's more understanding of the importance and the American Heart Association actually added this to the um, prevention guidelines where you are actually supposed to ask about pregnancy complication history. Now, interestingly, when I was a resident, the pregnancy record with all of the complications didn't even transfer over to what we saw in primary care. So the only way to really find out whether or not someone had had one of these important pregnancy complications was to ask the woman. Um, but I think now there's somewhat more understanding of the importance of this. And you can see that ACOG in 2013 said something similar. It is important that women with gestational diabetes, hypertensive disorders or pregnancy or preterm birth be counseled that these disorders are associated with a higher lifetime risk of maternal cardiometabolic disease. So I think there's increasing understanding, maybe more so for gestational diabetes than some of these other conditions, but I think increasing understanding of the importance. So when we think about postpartum women, uh, we know that pregnancy weight retained beyond six to 12 months postpartum is usually retained long-term. About a quarter of women retain more than 4.5 kilos and some women even gain weight in their postpartum year instead of using, losing their pregnancy weight. We also know from studies that women with a history of these pregnancy complications are not more likely to make lifestyle changes and they're actually more likely to retain weight than women who didn't have pregnancy complications. 
So in my research and the research of others, we like to think of this as a window of opportunity to really decrease this risk by making lifestyle changes in the postpartum period. So how do we do this? How do we implement these guidelines to decrease cardiometabolic risk? Again, what we're trying to do is find these women who pop over, pop over that green line, that clinical threshold with their pregnancy. So ideally we'd find them after that index pregnancy do lifestyle modification and targeted early treatment. And then maybe their next pregnancy would be a healthy pregnancy. It wouldn't have one of these high-risk complications and they would not have early cardiometabolic disease. I think it's important to also note that this, the cards are a little bit stacked against us because we have a growing number of women who are entering pregnancy at a level of overweight or obese. So if you look at this figure, you can see from black to white, if you go into the categories of overweight, obesity class one, obesity class two, obesity class three, we're actually slowly increasing the number of women in each category who are enter entering pregnancy at these obese levels. And you can see that here, if we look at um, all adult females in the US, we have a growing in increased risk of extreme obesity and growing obesity rates as well. My research doesn't touch on this as much in terms of pre-pregnancy, but I do just wanna mention that going into pregnancy at a higher weight is going to increase the risk for all of these complications. What my research does try to do is address women who've had one pregnancy complication and at least help them lose weight before their next pregnancy. So again, let's go back to our case. What should we tell this woman who had her pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes and preeclampsia? What should we tell her to do? So the general goals for postpartum disease prevention in women who have elevated risk for cardiometabolic disease um, include encouraging breastfeeding to the greatest extent possible during the first year postpartum, encouraging appropriate use of contraception for birth spacing, and then evaluating glucose metabolism and other cardiovascular risk factors. First of all, women who have gestational diabetes need postpartum glucose testing in that um, postpartum period, we recommend around six weeks. And the adherence rates, particularly at UCH, are very poor to, for getting women to do this, but that's how we can best identify prediabetes and type two diabetes in that postpartum period. Then we should repeat glucose testing annually for women with prediabetes and otherwise at least every three years, and then consider metformin as well as a treatment. We want to help these women achieve a healthy weight. So we want them to return to their pre-pregnancy weight and then five to 7% weight loss, depending on if they are still overweight or obese after getting back to their pre-pregnancy weight. We want them to engage in moderate to vigorous physical activity, at least 30 minutes, five times, uh, five times a week and help them eat a healthy diet as well. And I think that patients have some understanding of these risks and what to do, but we certainly have a long way to go. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there is more understanding of the importance of gestational diabetes and how that predisposes women to type two diabetes. I think women who have preeclampsia and some of the other conditions we're discussing have somewhat less understanding. And I'll show you some data from a focus group study we did in patients with preeclampsia, and many of them didn't even know they had increased risk until we told them in the focus group and asked them to comment. One woman said, all right, so when I left the hospital, they basically said, well, you're in the hands of your OB. Six weeks after when the OB cleared me, she was, all right, well, now just go talk to your PCP. My PCP never said anything about this to me either. And this speaks to a bit of a gap between the um, OB uh, care where women go right after pregnancy, and then they switch over to primary care, but often we don't see them for a few years in that time period. And it's this really critical time period for postpartum weight loss and decreasing risk. Another woman said, it's pretty scary, especially because if our doctors aren't talking to us about this, I don't know what to look for in terms of heart disease. One answer to this that some institutions have adopted is doing specialized postpartum clinics. So they actually have clinics where they send women with these pregnancy complications for postpartum blood pressure monitoring, for example, for women with preeclampsia, and then they can also address some of these risk factors because often the OB has a very short six week postpartum visit and she does not have a ton of time to address um, all these issues with future risk. So that is one, one way to go. Um, the other part where I've really focused my research is, is looking at lifestyle interventions. And there have been uh, many lifestyle interventions attempting to address, particularly for women with gestational diabetes, um, helping them decrease their risk factors postpartum. And overall, they've tried in-person, they've tried telephone, mailings, and websites. 
In general, in postpartum women, recruitment and retention can be quite challenging, and the effects overall have been fairly modest. So now I'll move on to my research, and I'll show you some data from the, fit the Balance After Baby and the Fit After Baby trials. So first, we'll talk about the Balance After Baby pilot trial. Um, so for this trial, we adapted the diabetes prevention program uh, specifically for a web-based delivery. Um, and this was based on some qualitative research we did first where women felt like they really didn't wanna come in for any sort of postpartum intervention. They would much prefer an intervention they could access at home. And this was actually really before the time of apps. So we started with a web-based intervention. Uh, women could look at them on their phone, but it was kind of clunky. Uh, we used web-based delivery and they had a lifestyle coach whom they talked to remotely, primarily by phone. And so this was a randomized control trial of women who had recent gestational diabetes from six weeks to 12 months postpartum. We did it at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And the primary outcomes were weight loss at 12 months from six week weight and from pre-pregnancy weight. And we did see a significant change in weight for those randomized to the intervention. So if we look at the control group, um, when we measured them at baseline at six weeks to 12 months, they actually increased their weight a little bit, up about a pound, and our int intervention group was down about six pounds. So we saw a significant difference um, between those groups. Then if we looked at pregnancy weight retention, we saw at one year, the control group was still about 10 pounds above their pre-pregnancy weight, and the intervention group was down about a pound. So they actually got back to their pre-pregnancy weight and a little bit beyond. And that was also significant between groups. So based on this, the CDC funded us to do a bigger two-site trial. Uh, we did this study in Massachusetts and Colorado, and we um, did the Balance After Baby web-based lifestyle intervention. However, we updated the website um, to make it look more modern, and we also adapted it for um, so that it would be much easier to read on a mobile phone. We, this time we delivered the intervention in English and Spanish. So everything was available in Spanish, including the lifestyle coaching. And we had a site of using Denver Health. And so we had an enriched population of Spanish speaking and low income women. Our primary outcomes were weight change at 12 months from six weeks postpartum and weight, weight change at 12 months from pre-pregnancy weight. Uh, we also had planned to look at weight change and measures of glucose tolerance at 24 months. Um, but due to unforeseen governmental regulatory delays, uh, we uh, had to stop our study early. So we didn't really have power at our later time points. Today, I'll just present the 12 month data. So this is what the website looked like. So we redid the website. If you look up here in the upper right, uh, women could just click on an Espanol and switch the whole website into Spanish. And some of our bilingual women would actually go back and forth. Um, and you can see across the top, all the pieces of the website. So they had learning modules they were asked to do each week for 12 weeks. They could check their progress. They had action plans where they set goals. They could communicate with their lifestyle coach. They had a community so they could uh, chat with other women in the study and a toolbox and bonus modules with more information if they wanted. And here's just a look at the Spanish website. So again, they could flip back and forth if they wanted to. Here's the learning modules and we asked them to do one per week, um, similar topics as the diabetes prevention program, but targeted for postpartum women. And then they could watch their, their weight and their steps. And we even had a control website, which we didn't do in the first trial. So women could actually uh, get resources if they were in the control group and also make sure they knew when they had their study visits and what they had to be prepared for. For this study, we had 181 women all together. And the difference between groups wasn't significant when we looked at the whole group. So the control group um, gained about a pound, similar to our other study, but the intervention group was only down about two pounds. And then when we looked at weight retention, our control group was up about 10 pounds above their pre-pregnancy weight at a year. The intervention group was above, about five pounds above. Um, and th this was significantly different. So for this study, we had done it we had planned to do a pre-specified analysis by ethnicity and partly because we had done Spanish language website and coaching and we had um, enhanced our recruitment, including Denver Health to do low income Hispanics as well. And this was really interesting. So when we look at the non-Hispanic but mixed race women, so um, white, black and Asian women who identified as non-Hispanic, this was 120 women in the study, 
the control group was down a little and the intervention group was down about six pounds, similar to our pilot study. And this was a significant difference between groups. However, when we looked at the Hispanic women, we saw the intervention group actually did worse. They, were, they had gained about six pounds during the study, the control group around five. This wasn't significant, but, but they actually um, were, was in the opposite direction that we would have expected. Similarly, when we look at weight retention in, 120, in these 120 women, uh, the control group is up about nine pounds and the intervention group is just two pounds over their pre-pregnancy weight. And this was also significant between groups. And then if we look at the Hispanic women, there's really no difference. They're both about 13 pounds above their pre-pregnancy weight. So in summary, from the, the balance after baby trial, we did see that the web-based program led to a trend in greater weight loss overall in the whole group and less significantly less postpartum weight retention at 12 months. But the most fascinating part of this study is that in mixed race non-Hispanic women, this, this intervention really worked. And then if we looked at the Hispanic women alone, the intervention was not effective. So we are still analyzing these data, trying to figure out what happened. I think some clues from the literature for why it might not have worked in Hispanic women. Um, we do know that low-income Hispanic women are twice as likely to experience significant postpartum weight retention versus white non-Hispanic women. In general, low Hispanic women, uh, low-income Hispanic women have less intervention engagement. And studies generally show general um, greater acceptance and even desirability of overweight among Hispanic women. So we are plotting to do some uh, more formative work to address this and figure out if there's a different way that we should um, give the intervention or a totally different form format that might work better for Hispanic women. So now I'm gonna move on to a study uh, that I actually just finished. So these are preliminary data hot off the presses. Um, this was the Fit After Baby M Health Lifestyle Intervention Program. And when I was doing these web-based studies, I had a lot of women telling me they really wanted an app. So when I moved to the University of Colorado from Boston, I started working on developing an app for postpartum women that would deliver an intervention. So we do know the reasons I wanted to do this um, in part because women were asking for it. We also know that women of childbearing age are active smartphone users. Uh, postpartum women tell us they prefer interventions they can actually access from home and on their own time. You know, they would say, I wish I could just look at it when I was breastfeeding or when I was in line at the post office. Um, we also need interventions for women um, in all those categories. So not just gestational diabetes, but also women who had preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, small for gestational age babies and preterm birth, all those other categories that have high risk. And there are apps out there. There's the post post baby weight loss challenge, there's diet and exercise for mom, there's skinny mom, there are mom apps, but in general, they're not evidence-based. Um, they haven't been tested in randomized trials um, and they may not be adapted for women with this, these cardiometabolic risk factors. So we created the Fit After Baby app, um, which was adapted from the diabetes prevention program. Overall, the goals were to set realistic goals while managing postpartum demands incorporating dietary changes to create an energy deficit and while accounting for breastfeeding, increasing physical activity, decreasing sedentary time, promoting self-efficacy and also managing stress. Um, it, is, it does have a foundation in behavioral science and health communication theory. We use evidence-based content. And the cool thing about the app is I deliver it in little bite-sized pieces each day. So that's just one to five minutes they can quickly um, see the content for that day and then it's interactive. So there'll be quizzes, there are points and they can interact with their coach through the app as well. Um, we also have trackers to track diet, weight, steps, sleep, stress and hunger. There's a gamification component. I'll show you more later, but they can earn points. Uh, they have a lifestyle coach who targets their coaching because she can watch what they're doing in the app. And then the um, entire app was optimized via an iterative development process. So the weekly themes are similar to our other studies, but we did add um, in response to women, women requesting more about stress management and coping. We have some mind body techniques um, in the stress management week. And then overall we have um, education about diet, physical activity um, and how to control your environment. So we did an iterative development process, but we did some alpha testing and then we did three rounds of beta testing with women who had these pregnancy complications who were postpartum. We had them use the app, give us feedback, 
uh, every week, do focus groups after, and after each round, we would iterate the app to make it better. And just to show you what it looks like, here's the home page. Um, women can see each day, they can see what they have to do. So for this woman, the goal was to do 10,000 steps that day. And these check boxes automatically check off, which are postpartum women love. So if they wear their Fitbit and they get to 10,000 steps, then that green check will appear. Same with if they're tracking their diet this week, they were talking about fat. So they had to keep their saturated fat below 7%. That will check off if they're tracking their exercise minutes. And then the for you is the content for that day. They have weekly tasks as well, which include weighing in and talking to their coach. So here's an example of just some other pages. So weighing in, we had them do this every Monday. Um, we have knowledge and education in the beginning of the week, Monday, Tuesday. So in this, on this screen, they can choose their pregnancy condition and find out more about why it's important for them to make lifestyle changes. Um, here's a, a screen about learning more about exercise and how it helps. And a lot of these are interactive, so they can click on the boxes and learn more. They have, we have them set a goal every Tuesday, and actually the coach will set their goal in her own app. It will pop up on their screen, and then she, the coach and the participant can talk about whether or not they need to adjust the goal. Then we have quizzes, so here's uh, learning about the balance plate. Um, we give them a chance to give feedback, so how was your workout, and they can tell us, and then the coach can actually see this on her app. And so she'll know if they had trouble or something was going on um, medically or something like that. Um, women ask for more uh, pictures and information about how to exercise with their babies. So we have a, some um, content on that as well. Um, we had a coach's challenge every week. So they would actually, um, this was optional. They didn't get points for it, but they could pick, um, this was the carb week. They could pick a grain they've never used before, click on a recipe and make it. And that would achieve that challenge. Um, and then we have a bunch of recipes. We have um, part of what we learned from women is we need a lot of um, postpartum normalization and acceptance. So we do talk about how hard it is to be postpartum, how hard it is to lose weight postpartum and um, all the other challenges of being a new mom. We have a separate curriculum for breastfeeding moms. So you can be in the study if you were breastfeeding or not, but if you wanted to click, there's a separate um, information for women who are breastfeeding and same with mom that are working, just separate tips for them as well. And then we have some quote of the week, some inspiration on the weekend. Um, we give them feedback on how well they did on their goals. And then they can see how they're doing on point. So we have um, these four levels of health warrior badges that they can achieve. And in response to feedback, we gave women a target gift card for reaching each of these levels. So every time they got it, they would get a target gift card in, in their email. And we did have, um, they could go back and read previous content. They could favorite content so they could go see it where um, all in one place. They could send content to family or friends. We had all a whole bunch of recipes they could access separately. And then we did a yoga curriculum where they had um, two different yoga poses per week and they could see them all in one part in the app if they wanted to see that. So the coach, this was our coach, um, Kristen, uh, for the Fit After Baby trial. And she has her own app and she can see how everyone's doing, how much weight they've lost, how much time they've been in the study. She can hone in on their weight, check out how they're doing with their steps and see how they respond to questions. So let me move on to the Fit After Baby trial, which we just finished. To be included, women had to have one or more of those pregnancy conditions. So gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, preterm delivery, or small for gestational age. They had to be between the ages of 18 and 45. Uh, their BMI at randomization had to be overweight or obese, so 26 to 45, or um, given that Asian women have higher cardiometabolic risk at lower BMI, um, if Asian women had to just have a BMI of 24. And then for this study, we now have an Android version, but we had only an iPhone version, so they had to have an iPhone or an iPod to be part of this study. So we randomized women. This was a pilot trial. Um, so we wanted to really get at feasibility and acceptability, so we had twice as many women that we put in the um, Fit After Baby program so we could get more data on app use. We asked them to download the app and use it daily for 12 weeks. We asked them to track diet and physical activity using Fitbit. And we asked them to communicate with the lifestyle coach by email or phone or text once a week. Uh, we had an active control arm. So women who were assigned to the text for baby active control arm were asked to download the app. Uh, they would get um, two to four free text messages per week. And these were interactive text messages 
The content included baby care and resources for women tailored to their number of weeks postpartum, but not really a focus, um, just a minor focus on losing weight and being healthy, but not the primary focus. So that's why we use it as the active control. So to show you the flow through the study, we would recruit women when they had their um, diagnosis of their pregnancy complication in the third trimester, or um, more commonly, um, just after delivery in the hospital. We had them come in between four to 12 weeks postpartum. We had them do a baseline study visit, and at the end, we would randomize them even, either into the text for baby arm or into the M Health program. And then we asked them to come back at six months and 12 months postpartum for study visits. The primary outcome was weight change at 12 months from the measured weight at six weeks postpartum and also from the self-reported pre-pregnancy weight. And then we also are planning to look at metab cardiometabolic risk factors, blood pressure, waist circumference, diet, and physical activity changes, and also process measures. So how much did they use the app? How much did they talk to the lifestyle coach? Um, how engaged were they? How satisfied? And the adherence to tracking of diet and physical activity, how many points did they earn and which goals did they meet? For statistical analysis, the baseline characteristics, we did Pearson, um, Fisher's T-tests, and Wilcox and Rake sum. And then our primary outcome for weight was looked at in an intent to treat fashion. Missing data were addressed using a mixed effects regression model. And we did a sensitivity analysis controlling for breastfeeding and gestational weight gain. So I will present now the preliminary results from the pilot trial. So um, of the women who we had eligible, who were consented and eligible to come in, we had 82 women who came in for the six week visit and they were randomized two to one. So we had 54 women into the fit after baby intervention and 28 into the active control. Uh, we then had uh, 41 women come in for the, who we could get data for the six month assessment and then 24 for in the text for baby group. But then the COVID pandemic hit <laughs> before we could finish the primary outcome for, for all the women. Um, so I think this is important because, well, first of all, many of you know, um, the CCTSI actually closed down to study visits for about four months for studies in my category. So for four months, we couldn't bring any women in for in-person study visits. Um, so that was a challenge. Uh, the other big challenge, and when, when we opened back up, some women in the fall of 2020 were not willing to come in with their babies and do their final study visit. So we lost a lot of women um, to come in to collect data for the primary outcome. The other part is the COVID pandemic, and I'll show you more data about this in a minute, but actually affected these women. So it changed diet habits, it changed exercise habits, it changed weight. Um, and so it had a lot of unforeseen changes that the you know, 12 week diabetes prevention program really wasn't designed to address, um, developed, you know, delivered on the app. So, so this was a major challenge. So we had um, 41 and 21 who came in, but we had um, 16 women who had their primary outcome um, during the COVID pandemic and um, six in the, in the um, control group. So when we look at our whole study, that um, they were pretty well randomized. The average age was about 30. Um, we had a um, somewhat di diverse group with about 75% white, 15% um, black, um, and then about a quarter women identifying as Hispanic. Uh, Pre-pregnancy BMI was just in the obese range at 30. Gestational weight gain a bit higher in the intervention group, but it actually wasn't significant. Um, 33 pounds versus 27 pounds. Um, and then they came in around the same time. Their baseline postpartum BMI at that baseline visit was about 32. Uh, we did have a significant difference in women who were breastfeeding with more women breastfeeding in the control group than the intervention group. Um, we had about the same 50% of women who were nulliparous or had their first child. And then um, some differences, but not significant in terms of the pregnancy conditions with more women with gestational diabetes in the control group, but then more women with preeclampsia and um, preterm birth in the intervention group. And then somewhat sicker population in our intervention group with about 40% with more than one condition versus 25% in the control group. So when we look at the data in the whole group, um, there is not a significant difference. So um, the text for baby women lost about four pounds from baseline to their 12 month assessment, and then about six pounds in the intervention group. And then similarly, when we look at weight retention, there's actually a little bit more, but not significant weight retention in our fit after baby group. They, they did start at a higher, um, they did have more pregnancy weight gain, although it wasn't significant. 
um, and the difference between groups is about 2.2 pounds. But we were worried about the impact of COVID and we actually decided to, while we were waiting, we couldn't bring women in for study visits, we did a survey um, in May of 2020. So um, fairly in the beginning of the pandemic. And we asked women how they were doing and 39% said they were doing less physical activity than they were before, but 28% said they were doing more. 33% said they were eating more poorly than they were before and 11% said they're actually eating better and 35% of women said they gained weight during COVID versus 24% who lost weight. So we did an analysis taking out the women who had their primary outcome measured during COVID. So these are just the 60 women measured before COVID. Um, and then we see at the, the P is 0.07, we weren't powered without um, all the women in the cohort, but it's at least in the direction we would expect where the fit after baby women lost about nine pounds and the text for baby women lost about three pounds. And then we see um, more what we would expect for pregnancy weight retention as well, though it wasn't significant with the text for baby women about six pounds above their pre-pregnancy weight and the fit after baby women about a pound and a half. We did see really good engagement. So I think this part is um, really promising. They did log into the app a median of 61% of all the days for, we asked them to use the app for 84 days in a row. Um, they wore their Fitbit a lot and the median number of days wearing the Fitbit was 59 and 11 women or 21% wore their Fitbit every single day for 12 weeks. And then 68% um, wore their Fitbit for more than half the days. And then they checked in with the lifestyle coach a median of five times with 43% checking in at least half the weeks and 25% actually um, three quarters of the weeks. And they did mostly email check-in. So I think this has its pros and cons. Um, it was really easy from the app to just launch an email and check in with your coach, but it made it a more low intensity intervention because they had um, somewhat limited communication. It wasn't really the same as talking to the lifestyle coach on the phone and only 13% used text and phone FaceTime was only 6%. So this is different than some of the previous studies that we looked at. We did focus groups at the end and we got some really nice satisfaction feedback. So one woman said, I would say it was very motivating and empowering in a time when I felt where I felt neither motivated or empowered. Another woman said, my favorite part of the fit after baby was the fact that it was accountability and with the exercises and stuff like that, it got me motivated. I liked that I could keep a log of stuff. So, so like a little bit of a diary while I was trying to lose weight slash trying to be healthy. I liked it. I thought it was encouraging. And a woman said, I thought it was helpful. Looking back, like I said, using other apps, I was like, I did think it was really good. It was engaging and motivating. And I actually lost the most weight with that app. It was supportive in that postpartum period. It was nice to just go on there and I'm like, oh, they understand I just had a baby. My husband doesn't understand me. So in summary, I would say that the Fit After Baby M Health intervention did show feasibility and high levels of user engagement also a high level of satisfaction and a potential trend in greater weight loss from six weeks to 12 months uh, when we take out um, those women who had their endpoints measured during COVID. For future directions, I'm hoping to improve personalization of the app to see if we can get improve the efficacy. And I also have a grant I submitted to do an adaptive trial so that we actually intensify the intervention for those who don't respond well, but let those women who are doing really well with just the app continue. So in conclusion overall, I hope I have shown that there's a clear association between pregnancy complications and future cardiometabolic risk. Um, I do think that the rise in obesity is going to exacerbate the incidence of pregnancy complications and the prevalence of cardiometabolic disease. So this issue is not going away. We're only gonna see more patients in this situation. There are clinical recommendations for early identification of at-risk women, um, and we need to address primary prevention strategies. I think we need more more research on web-based, app-based interventions or other interventions to help these women make changes in the postpartum period so that we can identify effective intervention programs that we can actually use clinically. And I want to just acknowledge um, my funders, um, both NIH, CDC, and then um, University of Colorado. And also um, all the mentors I've worked with over the years, my collaborators and all the research assistants I've worked with as well. And thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks, Dr. Nicholas. <clears throat> really important work um, and very innovative approaches. Um, I, um, 
I keep wondering how valid the information is, um, you know, when in terms of people self-reporting diet and uh, self-reporting intake and exercise and things like that, what kind of checks do you have on the system? And, and are there any more direct ways of assessing uh, those, uh, those inputs? In other words, uh, can people take pictures of their meals when they're eating them and, um, and show what they've eaten during the day and have that electronically interpreted and calorie counted, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it's such a good question. And one of the challenges of doing this kind of research for sure. Um, the study I just showed was on my K budget. So I didn't have a lot of, of funding um, to be elaborate, but I do think the, the photo diaries are coming a long way in terms of being able to assess dietary intake. Um, the biggest problem among my colleagues who've tried it is that um, people get kind of tired of it. So they'll do it for a while. And I, I would like to do some more intensive uh, assessment in my next grant, um, but whether or not you can get people to do that for a long period of time, I think is, is one of the problems with tracking. People just struggle to track their diet every day for a long period of time. Um, same thing for physical activity, um, you know, with Fitbits and phones and watches, I think we're getting better and better at being able to monitor people. Um, for the grant that I, that I put in, I did propose to do accelerometers just to get much better data on the women um, so that we can really compare and, you know, looking at the physical activity data from this study, some of the self-report data is just really hard to, it's really hard to interpret. So um, hopefully we can get more sophisticated about those methods. Other methods like doubly labeled water for energy balance, there are ways to be um, more intensive about measurement, but then it's always a balance with an intervention like this that you hope can be really scalable. So if we can prove it in a small scale, eventually women can, um, you know, thousands of women maybe could use it and we could see a bigger population effect. Mm -hmm. How long-term are these benefits in terms of uh, staving off diabetes? Uh, ha has it been looked at for five, 10 years? Not very well. I mean, the DPP is the best that we have in terms of data and then some of the other big DPP-like trials that have happened. I mean, we do know that there is some lasting effect even when people regain weight. So I think there's some benefit even if you can um, decrease weight for a couple of years and then you end up going back up. But we haven't had the kind of long-term studies we need to really look at the effective interventions over time. So with ACOG pushing for one more year or for one year of care for MCD patients postpartum, do you think this would make the research easier? Absolutely, I'm so glad they did that. So this is really the concept of the fourth trimester. Um, instead of maybe cutting off insurance funding at six weeks or very quickly postpartum, that we actually try to work with women for a whole year postpartum. So I think, especially collaborating with the OBGYNs and um, trying to have a more um, comprehensive uh, approach to disease prevention postpartum, I think it's actually great. And I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. So Karen Chaco wants to know, has there been any discussion about a transition clinic from GDM and other pregnancy complications between OB and primary care? I think it would be great. Some of us have been talking about it and I think um, doing something like this at University of Colorado would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you been planning that at all or are you proposing that? We've just started talking to some different stakeholders to see, but um, if, if anyone listening is interested, feel free to get in touch with me. I think we should work, work towards that goal. And I guess the, the question is about drugs, uh, metformin specifically, but more generally, um, uh, when to think about drugs. So it's a great question. I think one of the hardest part is um, when you're looking at women of childbearing age, uh, we are certainly limited in the drugs we can use, but I think metformin is definitely a safe one. If you look at the diabetes prevention program and you look at um, women who had a self-reported history of gestational diabetes, it was pretty remote, um, but the lifestyle intervention was about 50% effective and, the, and metformin was about 30%. So it's not as effective as lifestyle, but I think we all know as clinicians, some of our patients are not going to make the lifestyle changes. So mm -hmm. I think we need to be more proactive in getting some of these women on um, metformin earlier. Mm -hmm. I'd love to look at some of the other medications that are coming out that may be helpful, especially for weight loss, um, like the GLP-1s. Um, but again, we get into that tricky area where once you're putting um, women of childbearing age on some of these medications, it can be, it can be more difficult to study. 
So, you know, I just want to reemphasize these are really important lifestyle changes that occur relatively early in life that set the course uh, for how things unfold later in life. So uh, very impactful research uh, that um, will result in a lot of quality years of life gained. Um, and uh, so I want to congratulate you on that. Um, but I also want to give you the opportunity for making any closing remarks you might have. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I do think there's increasing awareness of this issue, but um, I think the sooner, especially in internal medicine, that we can identify some of these pregnancy complications and the importance going forward, we will be able to cut down on the future cardiometabolic risk. And because of the growing rates of overweight, overweight and obesity and the number of women who are going into pregnancy overweight and obese, I think it's really critical that we do a better job of addressing it now. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Really appreciate uh, you pulling this together. And uh, more importantly, um, I, I, I value the, uh, the impact of your work and the impact of your work will be felt in your patient population. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.